down the rabbit hole the last 18 months of uh, MMDVM, uh, which is multi-mode digital voice modem. Um, who here, raise your hands, who here uh, excluding in the program today has heard the term MMDVM? Can, oh, probably about, yeah, about a third there. Uh, who here uh, knows what it is? Far less. <laughs> well, hopefully I can um, demystify a little bit, show you a little bit of what we've been playing with. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a piece of software that will start it off as software, but it's also software and hardware, uh, designed and written by Jonathan Naylor, G4KLX. Very intelligent bloke, top bloke. And, um, uh, he built it because he uh, wanted to get into building a DMR repeater. <laughs> Still looking. Uh, yeah, he wanted to get into uh, building a DMR repeater. And this was uh, back a couple of years. Uh, and uh, so basically a little bit of the story of um, when we get there, his, um, his journey, uh, how he started off, how he, he uh, is also the same bloke who built the D-Star sound card repeater back in 2009. So uh, that was his first digital voice project. And uh, yeah, then he uh, went along and did the MMDVM. Still, because there's no phone service in here. That's what we're playing. <laughs> We got it, it's just downloading. <laughs> See what the thing is, I thought about putting on a USB flash drive. <laughs> Should have done that, no matter. Well, I'll probably end up putting yours on the other ones, which is Brian's. Move up, we'll move on. <laughs> Mm. Down the rabbit hole of uh, MMDVM. Uh, we've got a um, few logos here. Uh, ignore the free DV logo. MMDVM doesn't do that. I just ripped that image off of Google Image Search because I was lazy. <laughs> so uh, ignore that. But um, uh, these are the main modes, aside from free DV, these are the main modes that MMDVM supports at this point in time P25, D Star, DMR, NXDN, System Fusion. Uh, firstly, a couple of people to thank. Jonathan, G4KLX, is the uh, mastermind behind it. He started this whole project off. He is the driving force behind it. He writes most of the code. Uh, second, Andy, CA6JAU. Brilliant bloke. Uh, he really knows his stuff. Very bright boy. Uh, he uh, helped uh, Jonathan with some of the roadblocks. In particular, um, at one point there was a D-Star roadblock with the MMDVM not properly firing up uh, in D-Star mode and Andy sorted that out for Jonathan. Uh, he also forked the MMDVM into the MMDVM HS project, uh, which I'll explain in a minute what it is. Uh, Jim KI6ZUM, he built the first hardware, because MMDVM is three things. You've got MMDVM hardware, you've got MMDVM host, which runs on a computer, Raspberry Pi, whatever, uh, then you've got the MMDVM firmware, which runs on the hardware. Uh, Gus Van Doren, P1 PLM, uh, he built the uh, DV Mega project, uh, one of the first really good uh, digital hotspots. Uh, he uh, gave um, Jonathan a lot of input into the MMDVM as he was uh, building it. And many, many other, it's too many to name, amateurs, uh, that have put countless hours, absolutely countless hours into it. A uh, lot of people here that really, it's a fantastic community, put a lot of effort into it. Bit of the history. Uh, as I said, Jonathan wrote the uh, sound card based D-Star repeater back in 2009. Uh, it was, I don't think it was the first, but I think it was the first major non-commercial repeater that would do D-Star. Uh, of course, what it sounds, it's, uh, use a sound card on a computer, 
transmitter, receiver, you got yourself a DSTAR repeater. Uh, then um, they started up with the G2 gateway software, then they got kicked off G2 once uh, word got round that they were using non-commercial repeaters on G2, so uh, wrote uh, the IRC GDB gateway. Um, IRC GDB itself is not written by Jonathan, it's written by, um, I think they're Danish blokes, I could be wrong. Uh, but yeah, the IRC DDB, DDB gateway allowed Jonathan's repeater to link into the IRC DDB network. Uh, for those that don't know, that's how DSTAR repeaters and users find each other. Uh, and then in 2014, he started thinking about a uh, DMR repeater. Uh, DMR had gotten off the ground then um, by the DMR Buck guys. Uh, and he looked at the standard he did. And that time, he decided it was a bit difficult to put it on the shelf. Near to 2015, he goes to um, Hamvention. Uh, actually, the I think it was the, the uh, uh, Northwest Radio guys invited him over to uh, Hamvention. Uh, they do the DV Mini and TV4 Mini and uh, the Thumb DV. And uh, he went up while he's over there. He got talking to the uh, DMR Mark guys, and he said, "Oh, hey guys, I'd like to build an open source DMR repeater." They said, to him, "No, no, 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 you can't do that. You can only you can only use Motorola gear." Can't build an open source repeater. No, can't be done. Yeah, that's the wrong thing to say to Jonathan. <laughs> he, he's like, well, okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> so, what is it? Okay, so you've got the uh, hardware interface motor. That is what connects to your uh, transmitter receiver. What we're doing is converting uh, conventional FM transmitters. Now, it, the limitation, it'll only work of digital modes that can be detected by a standard FM discriminator. Uh, so Tetra, for example, will never work. Uh, the way Tetra works, it'll never work. Um, so it's uh, not all FM transmitters can be converted. Um, Software-defined transmitters are particularly hard because of timing issues, which we'll go into detail in timing. Um, but uh, I've converted uh, tapes, Dave, VK2JDS, converted motor rollers. Uh, a whole bunch of people have um, converted everything from Simico, Yesu, uh, all sorts of radios converted to uh, run with the MMDVM. Um, you then, so that's the, the hardware motor. You got the MMDVM host software. It runs on quite commonly a Raspberry Pi is the most common thing, but it'll run on anything from a Linux PC, Windows PC, uh, Mac. Whatever the MMDVM host is, the brains of it. It's what gives you connection to the outside world, uh, to the network. The modem and firmware, hardware, hardware modem and firmware. All it does is modulate and demodulate the digital signal. It doesn't do anything with it. It just demodulate. Well, incoming signal demodulates it, sends it to the MMDVM host software. Host software says, "Oh, this is a valid uh, color code. This is a valid user. Okay, I'll fire up." Um, as I said, supports digital modes on one repeater. Uh, can be you can lock it down to a single mode if you just only want a D-Star repeater. You use MMDVM. All you do is enable D-Star mode. If you want DMR, you just enable DMR mode. Uh, in our case, for our club, uh, our three repeaters, um, one of them runs D-Star DMR P25. Another repeater runs DMR only. A third repeater has both. Uh, uh, DMR and Fusion turned on. Uh, as I said, it is a time-shared arrangement. So on a busy repeater, you wouldn't activate more than one mode uh, because you run into contention issues. While the repeater's in DMR mode, you know, every other mode's locked out. Uh, on quiet repeaters like uh, Central West New South Wales, where we are, brilliant. It lets us play. Uh, there's only a handful of us that have digital radios. We can play whatever we want. We just go into the repeater, fire it up. There's no contention issues. And it's an inexpensive way of bringing new life to underutilised repeater frequencies. And uh, it's an inexpensive option for clubs that don't have much funds to bring a digital repeater on the air. Uh, I don't know what a, what was a commercial D-Star repeater, two grand, would that be a fair estimate? Uh, we, uh, our first repeater that I built, the only thing we didn't pay for was the cavities, because we had cavities. 400 bucks, that's how much it cost. And that's including buying everything from uh, coax, transmitters, second hand of course, 
uh, secondhand transmitters. Um, the uh, Raspberry Pi, down to the memory card. Uh, it was what, 415 or 412 or something, all up, that's what we spent. So it's an inexpensive way for clubs that don't have much funds behind them to have a play. When Jonathan started off, the main issue was choosing suitable hardware to host the modem. Uh, sound card, he decided early on, sound card and fobs are too tricky. Uh, they do all sorts of weird, you can have DC BIOS on them, you can, uh, DC BIOS I should say. Uh, you, they, you know, they're different levels from different sound cards, interface issues, they're just, they're just a pain. So he decided straight up, he didn't want to go down the sound, part, but sound card fob way of doing it. The hardware used needed to have a decent ADC and a decent DAC because you need to, incoming signal, you need to be able to sample the voltage, work out what it's doing. Same on the output. He uh, was happy to have separate hardware, uh, separate hardware and uh, software interface. So the software, as I said, common element Raspberry Pi. The hardware uh, plugs into the Raspberry Pi and they're separate units. He didn't have a problem with that. Uh, the experience he gained from the sound card modem when he wrote that showed him that nearly anything's possible in software. No need to tie down to proprietary ICs. Uh, so it meant that it gave us flexibility. Uh, if we could write it in software, well I should say if he could write it in software, we could do it. Uh, so the end result of course was the MMDVM host software which runs on the computer, browser file, whatever and the NMDVM firmware, which runs on the hardware. So with his selection of um, the hardware, he read an article, 2015 by Barry Chambers, G8AGN, where he'd used an Arduino GUA, and he'd uh, done something very clever with it. Uh, he was sampling from a uh, IF of a uh, radio and using it to display a spectrum graph just using the analog to digital converter in the Arduino GUA and just displaying a spectrum graph. And that gave Jonathan the idea, well, why couldn't he do similar? So he got to think about using it. Uh, he, he started off with DMR because that's the one he wanted to do. He was interested in it then. It seemed like a challenge, so that's why he started. D-Star, D-Star and everything else he added, he added later, but once the base was done, the rest was easy. Uh, DMR, of course, is TDMA, time domain multiple access, which means we have two time slots. Uh, you have uh, time slot one, time slot two, so you can have two separate QSOs going on the same repeater at the same time, completely independent of each other. It's also the same technology used in GSM and Tetra, although GSM and Tetra have four time slots. There's a suit, one repeater, multiple QSOs case of DMR2 time slots. The repeater transmits continuously. Uh, there's no switching on and off of the repeater. It uh, just transmits continuously. Uh, whether there's one time slot in use or both time slots in use, the repeater will always transmit continuously. And we'll have some uh, graphs on that in a minute. Um, the users transmit on one frequency as well, but they only transmit in bursts. Uh, in DMR it's 27.5 milliseconds. Uh, but yeah, so they transmit, user one will transmit time slot one, then he'll wait. Then he'll transmit in time slot one, then he'll wait. While he's waiting, user two is transmitting in time slot two. In the Etsy standards, uh, for DMR, BS means base station, MS means mobile station. We'll just keep using that because it's easy. So this is TDMA. Base station up top, you can see, constant transmission. Two time slots. In between, you've got a catch. That basically keeps it simple, it's just signaling information. Basically, it's just the repeater saying, okay, time slot, or oh, at the beginning there, time slot two is finished, time slot one go now. Then it's time slot one finished, time slot two go now. That's all that's basically said in there. In the middle, not at the end, in the middle of each time slot, you've got sync and embedded signaling information. Uh, embedded signaling information be like your DMR ID or the transmitting DMR ID. Uh, also using it send APRS packets in that part, all sorts of stuff. So uh, that's, that's in the middle. On the mobile station, 
see there's gaps between the time slots. So user one transmit, there's a gap. User two transmit, there's a gap. However, from here to here is 30 milliseconds. From here to here is 27.5 milliseconds. That's our guard time. Now that's very important. Also comes into the distance limitations of DMR. As a result, timing needs to be very accurate from both the base station and the mobile station. Uh, the downside is there is a distance limit. The DMR standard gives us about one millisecond. Now that's one millisecond total. So half a millisecond out, half a millisecond back, speed of light becomes an issue. It's about 150k. In reality, a little bit more. But uh, officially, the distance limit is 150k. Uh, DMI mode is different. Direct mode operation, uh, that is simplex, not through a repeater. Uh, you don't have that limitation because it's just one station directly to another station. So we don't have that timing issue that can go forever. But uh, it's not like uh, analog where, uh, oh, there's an opening, 1,000 kilometres, sweet, I'll work it. You can't do that with DMR. Well, they can with the other digital modes, which I cover less on, but uh, they don't have the timing limitation of TDMA. The DMR specification from Etsy is very well written. It is beautiful. They detail everything. It's also very dry. Uh, but they have information about the protocol, information about all the bits, check codes, forward error correction, everything. Diagrams, uh, information, if you do this, this should happen. They don't tell you how to do it, <laughs> but they tell you it's, design, it's designed for a commercial company. So here, here's the standard, now go away and build a radio. Uh, and it, it, it is beautiful, well laid out. Uh, but yeah, there's no information on how to do it. Uh, Jonathan had to work all this out himself. Icon could learn a thing or two at D-Star. <laughs> so. um, generating the uh, base station signals, repeater signals, is relatively straightforward. Uh, there's a lot of little different checksum and forward error correction methods used. Every little bit of data has a different checksum. Uh, there's also extra data you can uh, transmit it for forward error correction. Uh, so uh, there's, that's designed for if you go into a short dropout, you don't lose your signal. The forward error correction compensates. So quite a lot had to be written by Jonathan uh, for the basic transmission to even start. The two main areas identified, it identified early on as being key. When the repeater is idle, all it is listening to white noise. You get a DMR handheld uh, and hit transmit. First thing it does, transmits a wake up packet. 27.5 milliseconds, out of nowhere. No sync information, no warning of it. It's just straight out of blue 27.5 milliseconds. Jonathan spent a lot of time trying to work out how to detect that packet out of nothing. And I don't know exactly his final solution. Uh, if get in contact with Jonathan, he'll tell you. Uh, let's talk, I emailed him. Jonathan, I put my foot in it, give me a hand. <laughs> so, uh, so that was one that Jonathan said he spent a lot of time on, how to detect that initial wake up. And most handhelds, they'll try three times. If the repeater doesn't wake up, they'll be at you. No good. And then, how to maintain lock when no synchronisation information is available, and I'll elaborate on that in a minute, but not back there earlier, I said the middle of the time slot, there's synchronisation information. Not every packet though. There's only synchronisation information, I think it's every 300 and something milliseconds. So you've got to maintain synchronisation in between uh, those sync pulses, so otherwise uh, because we got to fit inside that, inside that time slot, any drift, and we'll end up encroaching on another time slot. And this also, to explain on it, internally, the software transmitter and receiver are two separate parts of software. They're in the same hardware, but they're two separate parts of software. So the receiver has to know what the transmitter's doing as well, and there's a little bit of trickery to that one as well. Again, the Etsy specification was no help. Jonathan had to work out his own methods. This is a DMR frame, 30 milliseconds. So that's your guard. 
27.5 milliseconds of data. It uses the AMBI 2 codec, uh, D-Star uses AMBI 1, Fusion also uses AMBI 2, uh, P25, I think it's IMBE for memory. The voice is divided into 20 millisecond segments. So there's actually 60 milliseconds of voice here, but it's divided into 20 milliseconds of data. So you've got 20 milliseconds there, another 20 there, another 20 there. So three lots of 20 milliseconds make up your voice packet. And of course in the centre there is your sync or embedded signalling information. So this is a typical transmission. The first two packets. The uh, first one could be a wake up. Hello, I'm, I'm uh, ID 505 2045. I want to contact this talk group. Please wake up. The repeater comes back. Yes, go. You can start transmit. So then you get into the voice. They see the first three packets there have sync data. We don't have sync here, or here, or here, or here, or here. Or here. We have sync here. So this is why the receiver in the software has to keep track of what the transmitter is doing because there's no sync coming back for these five packets and why timing is so important and Jonathan wasted a hell of a lot of time in the early stages because his first MMDVM modem uh, uh, uses the Arduino Duo uh, is, the, is what he ended up deciding on uh, and um, he, when he first started off he used the internal crystal for his timing and uh, he, he's crap. Uh, it's something like uh, 10 or 15 ppm, which the Etsy standard specifies one ppm. That's what in the standard. <laughs> so you've got to be bang on. And uh, his uh, bit error rates were all over the place. Things were drifting. He was ending up in different time slots. He had a hell of a trouble. Um, Gus uh, Van Doren, he sorted this out. He worked out how to um, compensate in software. I don't know, again, I don't know the exact method, but he worked out a compensation in software that um, uh, it would it would auto adapt, uh, but for um, what John, uh, what uh, Jonathan did was easy to use a TCXO. So he had um, yeah, what have I written here? yeah. So he had a bit of trouble uh, at first trying to convince the Arduino GUA to take the external clock. Uh, most common one we use a 12 megahertz crystal, uh, 12 megahertz TCXO anything up to 24. Uh, I've got some built with 14. I've built some with 19.2. Uh, they've got to be a divisible number, which is in the, if you go look in an MMDVM code, it says it's going to be divisible, such and such, it's no big deal. Uh, but yeah, he used a TCXO, and with a bit of fancy code, managed to convince the, MM, uh, the Arduino GUA to take the external clock, and then he uses it to start counting. Now, it uses 24 kilohertz sampling. And that's how Jonathan counts time internally in the modem. Yeah, so one millisecond, 24 samples. So keeps it nice and simple. Just use the TCXO to count time that way. So the MS, handheld, car radio, whatever, it's locked to the information transmitted by the base station. So the MMDVM needs to synchronize its receiver with the transmitter. And this is what I meant by the MMDVM firmware is divided, it's in the one piece of hardware that's divided into two pieces of software. The transmitter and the receiver, they, they free wheel from each other. So it needed a way for the receiver to know what the transmitter was doing. Uh, no, it needed to know when the transmitter was sending the cache to change over from one time slot to another and also know where the incoming transmission should be relative to what is coming out of the transmitter because it should be fixed. Uh, if, a, uh, if a mobile station is transmitting into the repeater, the sync is coming from the repeater. So the mobile station should be locked to the repeater. It won't be generating its own clock, come from the repeater. So the receiver internally had to know what the transmitter was sending out. And as I said, we don't have sync pulses every single packet. So this is what Jonathan came up with. The MMDVM host software is here. That's the one that takes your data, uh, and decides what to do with it. This is your two time slots, and this is just serial data going between your computer and the MMDVM hardware. The hardware is here, your computer's over here, and this is just serial data. Uh, it's 
not really relevant what it is, it's just base serial data. The DMR transmitter takes it and converts it into a bunch of ones and zeros. Those zeros go into, on the end there, is the DAC, digital analog converter. Those zeros and ones, all they do is represent voltage levels. So, and, that, and then from the uh, DAC you then go into your FM transmitter. Second signal out of the transmitter is control data. Not relevant to the, uh, not relevant, the radio wouldn't know what to do with it, but it feeds it back into the DMR receiver section of the firmware. So the receiver knows what the transmitter is doing and it knows when it should be looking for data from a MS. It knows there should be, there should be a signal here now. Okay, let's look. And even if that sync pulse is not coming through, it knows from the transmitter, so okay, we should be expecting something. So, that, and so, that's, so that's how that works. And then of course it comes back in here, get the MMDVM host, and then the MMDVM host decides, oh, it's only a local call, we don't send it out to the internet. Oh, it's, uh, it's an internet call, we want to send it out to this reflector, or we want to send it out to this server. So the host does uh, that intelligent part. Does it work? Yes, very well actually. This was taken on Wednesday. Now this is the brand license dashboard. These are the total uh, statistics on Brandmeister. So of those repeaters, 950 of them were MMDVM based repeaters. The rest were commercial repeaters. Uh, most of them uh, refugees from DMR Mark. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, over 2,000 repeaters on the network. Look at the number of hotspots. That's brilliant. 6,170 hotspots. 3,000 of them MMDVM hotspots based on the MMDVM HS firmware. Uh, the rest made up of approximately 500, meg 500 dB mega hotspots, which run the dB mega firmware, but use the MMDVM host for the network connection. Uh, advantage of that is MMDVM host can do things that the blue DB software that comes with the DB mega can't. So a lot of people choose to use MMDVM host, particularly PyStar users. And the remainder made up of uh, DB megas running blue DB, open spots, DB4 minis. <laughs> what function does the hotspot perform? Is it just uh, access into the network? Yes. Um, I can't remember. I've had thought I had more detail on it, but basically, okay, so the hotspot, I, I do want to explain on that, and I thought I'd put more detail here, but I'll, I'll explain verbally. Um, okay, you're a user. The repeater up on the hill here, that's brilliant. You leave 100 k's that way. Oh, what do I do? That's the beauty of these uh, networks, and I'll, I will get into more detail on the networks themselves. But um, you can have islanded repeaters. Uh, there are networks in the US, it's an island. There's like six or seven repeaters, they're, they're just an island uh, they're on their own. They're linked between each other, but I can't, I can't transmit from here into there, and vice versa. But the default configuration is the repeaters are internet connected, and MMDVM host is designed from the ground up to support that. Um, so I can dial up uh, reflector, reflector 4400, for example, get a DMR radio, and again, I'll get into more detail, there is something on that, but I can dial up reflector 4400, which is UK wide. Get my radio, transmit, yeah, CQ, UK. Just like that, I'm uh, talking UK, and that's the brilliant of the networks. It's all, you can talk, or I can just talk locally, I can just use talk group nine, I go in on the repeater, back out on the repeater, I don't hit the network, I, I uh, just stay local. Or I can go statewide, 50 here in Queensland, I'm Brandmeister, 5054, Queensland wide. New South Wales, 5052, ACT, 5051, etc. Uh, or Australia wide, 5085. That's every, every brand master repeater in Australia. So, brilliant if you're in range of a repeater. Uh, you want to go you want to go on holiday uh, or you're at a range of repeater, what do you do? The hotspots, and I said the DV Mega and the DV4 Mini were one of the first ones. I've got to give credit where to you. Uh, but uh, the most popular one by far now is the MMDVM HS hotspot. Um, and, uh, actually, Peter, BK3 SNR, can, uh, it'll just grab one, I can show you, show you the size of them. Uh, they're a little transmitter. There he is. 
That's a MMDDM HS hotspot. That is a Raspberry Pi Zero on the bottom. And then the hotspot board, which I do have a photo of further down, uh, is the same form factor as the Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, in a little case, little antenna, 20 milliwatts. 100 metres, brilliant. So you take that with you. Turn on the, uh, turn on the uh, Wi-Fi hotspot on your phone. You've got internet access. Turn, plug in power to the hotspot. You're on the network, whichever network you want. It could be the D-Star network, P25 network, Fusion. Uh, and so that's what the hotspot is. It's for people that either want to operate mobile or out of range of commercial repeaters. It lets you get into the network. And um, so uh, I can be on a hot, you can, you can be on holiday in Alice Springs, middle of nowhere. As long as you've got phone service that you can get on the internet, you can then come out on the repeater here, in, uh, here on the Gold Coast, or in Sydney, or in the UK. You, you can just go where you want, it's, it's brilliant. Um, there will be demonstrations tomorrow, so I'll say to everyone, I've got a table set up tomorrow, I've got a bunch of hotspots, I have a fully operational repeater there. I can, anyone who wants to know and see it in action, ask me tomorrow, I'm more than happy to spend the time. So we've got the DMR working first. D-Star was easy to add, he'd already done it. He'd done it once before, so uh, it was pretty much based on what he'd done with the sound card repeater project. Simplified a little bit because obviously in the intervening years he'd learned things, but largely still the same. And of course still compatible with IRC DDB gateway. Why, invent, why, why reinvent the wheel? System fusion. There's a myth out there that system fusion is basically P25 with one bit change to make it incompatible. It's not. It's like a second cousin. Nice protocol. Uh, the RF side of the, and I'm talking about the RF side of the protocol. Nice protocol. Uh, fairly well specified. Y as X is not. Uh, Jonathan had to do a lot of, uh, uh, lot of backwards engineering to work out what was going on with the Y as X side of the RF protocol. But no, it's a reasonable good protocol. Implementation on the radios is, um, yeah, not the best. <laughs> Those are Jonathan's words, not mine. Uh, it could have been better, uh, but it works. Um, there's one downside. On analog repeater, if it's got a tone on it, you send the wrong tone, what happens? Nothing. Uh, if you've got a D-star repeater, you set the wrong RPT1, what happens? Nothing. Uh, DMR, you send the wrong colour code, nothing. Same with P25, you send the wrong uh, network access code. Nothing. System fusion, doesn't matter what you do, it'll fire up. It's basically open carrier access, which has the potential, so far it hasn't, but it has the potential to cause problems because there's no way of um, limiting access when you need to. Um, the other thing Jonathan did is he created an open source reflector system that is based on that YSX RF side, so you can control the, uh, the YSF, he calls it the YSF reflector system. You can control it using the standard YSX button on your fusion radio. Works the same uh, and, uh, and works brilliant. Uh, we now also have a recent development, we got access to the FCS reflector system which is a competing reflector system we didn't have access to but that's now working as well. So you can choose your reflector system. You can go where you want. The thing about it is choice. You've got choice. P25, my favourite mode. I'm a P25 fanboy. I'll put my hand up to that. I started on DMR, I'll admit that. I moved to D-Star. When I discovered P25, I stayed there. I absolutely love it. It's like the 160 metre band of the digital modes. Uh, it's, again, an excellent protocol documentation. It's a professional protocol designed for commercial use. So very, very well, uh, very, very well documented. Uh, Jonathan's biggest issue was lack of surplus P25 radios in the UK. They don't use it over there. So it was actually, uh, I think it was Ian VK2HK sent a P XTS 3000 P25 radio over to him. So Jonathan, can you do this? Yes, please. <laughs> so um, then of course, Jonathan had to create a open source reflector space system and it behaves like talk groups. Uh, again, simple, but it works, uh, and works well. Um, there is the P25NX reflector system, and that's used by uh, Quantar commercial repeaters. 
and there is an amateur P25 NX network. Jonathan has tried to link into it, but there's some magic bytes going on and it's not documented. So he hasn't got it working, he'd love to get it working, but it's not specified. So that still would be nice, but we're not there yet. Right, so how does it fit together? I mentioned the hotspot and I mentioned the modem. One big difference between the modem and the hotspot. The hotspot, and there'll be a photo in a minute, uh, uses uh, a analog devices ADF7021 radio on a chip. It's uh, basically a um, 60 megahertz through to 960 megahertz radio on a single chip. Change external inductors, and that's where it transmits. Um, the MMDVM modem has an advantage. It can listen to all modes that are enabled at once because it's just listening to the open, uh, open IF or open discriminated audio. Uh, the hotspot, the way it works, the actual decode is done in the ADS7021 chip. Different modes, it supports all the modes, but they're slightly different. So it's got to put the chip into different modes to detect a uh, signal. DV Mega has the same problem. Not a criticism on the DV Mega. Not a criticism on the DV4 Mini. They have the same problem too. Uh, I'm not quite criticising them. It's a limitation of the chip and we can't do anything about it. Uh, so you have, a, you have a problem, you might start transmitting uh, to your hotspot and if it's, if it's locked to one mode, not a problem. If it's locked to multiple modes, there might be a delay before the hotspot will recognise your signal and uh, start detecting it because you might be in the wrong mode when you start transmitting. You've got to wait till it switches through. Um, once it's in that mode, you have a mode hang and that's set in MMDVM host. The mode hang is how long the repeater or hotspot will stay locked in the mode after the last transmission. So there's an RF mode hang and there's a network mode hang. So if a transmission comes in from RF, it'll then lock to that mode and lock everyone else on other modes out until that timeout runs out after the last RF transmission. You have the same from the network side and that's configurable. Um, Mostly, most people just set them to 10 seconds, but you can set it to whatever you want. Um, on the modem side, it was quite easy for Jonathan. There's uh, less CPU load used because he can share some of the filters between modes. So it made it a bit easier for him. And only, I've missed a word there, only one mode is active on the transmitter part of the firmware at any one time. So CPU load is not an issue. It's not trying to have to keep in mind how to transmit all the different modes. It's searching for all the different modes, but it's only got one mode active in the transmitter at the time. And as I said before, the modem does the minimum amount of work before handing data to the MMDVM host software. The modem, all it does is uh, detect your digital signal, transfer it into a data stream, sends it to the host. The host then decides what intelligent stuff it wants to do with it. So how's it fit together? As I said, the host software, the host software decodes the data that's sent to it. Decides if it's intelligent data or useless data. Decides whether to fire up the repeater or what it wants to do. Rejects invalid calls, controls where this call is going, and controls the mode of the modem. It also supports external displays like the Nextium or I2C or HD 44870, I think, for memory. That's one of the first ones. These are FC301 Delta data modems. Can't get them anymore. But uh, Jonathan had them set for one more in the screen. This is just <laughs> power filtering up here. There's the, uh, there's the Arduino Duo. There's the Zumboard. That's a Zumboard 1.0. That was the first, uh, one of the first designs. This separate board is the external TCXO. Because that Zumboard was designed before Jonathan knew he needed the external TCXO. The later designs, of course, had the TZXO built into the board, but yeah, now that's one of the first ones. That's how it all fits together. That's a fully working multi-mode repeater. A few more. This is the board that I put together for VK2 RDP. This is a hotspot board designed by Alex. S, uh, S56, no, SL56. Oh, that's appalling. <laughs> I know him. Sorry, Alex. 
Um, that board in the end is a design by Mathis, DB9MAT, and uh, Florian, uh, DF2ET. Uh, I built that one. 0402 size surface mount components. I learnt that night, don't sneeze. <laughs> That's uh, a, um, based on uh, what's called the Zumspot Libra. That was the, the Zumspot Libra was the first hotspot design. And the first hotspots, we just bought these ready-made modules from China based on the ADS 71 chip. And they were selling them as wireless data for microcontrollers, things like that. And we just abused them, of course. Uh, so this board is um, based on the uh, Zumspot Libra. The Zumspot Libra was designed by Jim, KI6ZUM. Uh, this particular one's built by Blass, EA7GIB. And this is one of the cheapest ways to get started if you want to build, a, build your own hotspot. Uh, it's just the ADS7021 chip, or board, a uh, STM32 blue pill microcontroller, and that's in a board designed to sit on top of a Raspberry Pi. That's just a Raspberry Pi hat. There's the uh, Pi Zero there and the STM32. That's VK2RDP. Uh, converted to T800. You'll be able to see that in action tomorrow. Another one by Blass. Uh, that's using that's an Orange Pi demo board. Again, the uh, ADS7021 board, STM32. Uh, that's an Orange Pi Zero. And up the top there is a 12 volt to 5 volt noise generator. We're going to have to wind up this one. Okay, okay. Um, okay, no worries. Well, there's DMI gateway. I'll be able to explain stuff about that tomorrow. Basically, we've got links between the modes. The barriers are broken down. You can talk on, uh, I can talk on someone on Fusion while I'm using DMR, P25 DMR, all that sort of stuff. Uh, DMR gateway lets you also have the one repeater connected to multiple networks. I can explain that tomorrow, anyone wants to ask. Uh, these are some of the latest developments. Now we've got NXDN, Fusion to DMR, Fusion to P25, Fusion NXDN, NXDN DMR, DMR to Fusion. Wrap up. So, 2015, Jonathan set out to write a DMR repeater. Now I've got DSTAR, DMR, Fusion, P25, and NXDN. Supports multiple hardware. Started on the Arduino Duo, now supports the Teensy, STM32 chips. Uh, the most common one, STM32 F446RE. Uh, it's a way to bring digital modes to uh, uh, repeaters for very little cost and repurposing FM equipment. And multiple hotspot hot spot designs, runs on Linux and Windows. There you go.